Uh, I'm going to call to order this, uh, this joint meeting of the Planning Board and the Committee on Legislative Matters of the Northampton City Council. Um, my name is Bill White. I'm uh, the Chair of Legislative Matters for the City Council. Um, in order to, uh, well, here actually, first of all, a few caveats. First of all, we're, this is being audio video recorded, sort of, on that camera there. Um, and this is for the purpose of informed consent. Um, and also, we'll have, after we do the roll call, there'll be an opportunity for public comment. And there's also a hearing. This is a hearing. And you'll be able to comment during the course of the hearing as well. So if, you, if you're here to uh, speak to issues specific, you might want to wait until we open the hearing. So, um, Laura, would you please call the roll? Sure. Um, Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor Carney. And Councilor Murphy. Here. And who will be presiding for uh, the planning board? Do you get a call roll? Do you want to official convening? No? Okay. I'm just taking a the oh, Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. So, um, is there any public comment in this part? Okay. Um, first up on the order on our agenda is approval of the minutes of our previous meeting. Is there a motion to accept those minutes? Motion to accept them. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those are the minutes of March 12th. Um, so now we come to the public hearing. Uh, there was a public hearing notice published March 26th in 2018. In April 2nd, 2018, this is for Mass General Law, uh, Chapter 40A, Section 5, and I will read for your edification. Um, the notice will also encompass basically the items that we're going to be addressing under this under this hearing. Uh, proposed zoning ordinance amendments is one to rezone parcels on uh, an East Hampton Road to offices of industrial, including uh, <coughs> Map 44-138 from Business Park to Office uh, Industrial, and then Map 41-31, 44 34-32, and 51-9, uh, from General Industrial to Office Industrial. Two, eliminate Business Park zoning in its entirety from the code. Three, rezone the following to Farms, Forest, Rivers, and that's portions of Map 44-21 that are not SC from Servant uh, Residential. A portion of map 21002 from SR, I'm sorry, suburban residential. A portion of map 6 65 from suburban residential and a portion from watershed protection overlay. And then a portion of map 1844 from general industrial portions of 7 35 10 D. Dash 001. I'm sure this is riveting for all of you. 13-51, uh, 22-7, 34-2 that are not S6. Uh, if I go on, I, actually, okay. Anyway, uh, I'll spare you the map indications unless somebody has any direct questions to that. But then we're also changing uh, certain sections from watershed protection and SR, and then from business park to general industrial. So I think you get the sense. Um, so, and that was what was published, and I suspect that that would account for some of the folks' attendance here today. So, first, I'll accept the motion to open the public hearing. So, mm -hmm. the other well, that's. I mean, it's oh, rezoning. I mean, it, it is starting to get in the weeds, and it'll all come up in the course of this. So, I don't think it's necessary actually to to put people into a coma as they read those things. So, anyway, so the. The motion was to open the public meeting, and it was second. And all those in favor of opening public hearing, please say aye. Aye. Okay. We're in the hearing section at this point. I'm sure you can tell the difference. <laughs> so um, this is the opportunity for people to speak for, opposed, or with questions on any particular item. And I was going to take them one at a time. Um, and if Carolyn, if, if you're okay, I would like you to give an overview of them first as we go. Okay. And then uh, folks who had thoughts or comments on those are uh, be invited to speak at that point. Is, that, is everyone okay with that? Does that work for everyone? So do you, because some of these are a little bit um, different, you know, there are eight or seven ordinances. So do you want me to go generally describe them all or go into 
detail one by one and then take questions on each one because they do they may have different implications right. implications and they are also related yeah i uh, this is a i had i did a consult with council murphy about that as okay. well trying to think about what <laughs> okay. the best way to proceed with that yeah. i think um probably in the interest of um, being comprehensive we'll do them one at a time okay and then if there's any anything that relates to the others that yeah. you can mention that okay. but certainly Perfect. not out of it yeah sure. okay okay so first up is item uh 18.063 this is an ordinance to rezone parcels on east hampton road to office industrial okay so um, this one sort of has two other ordinances related to it, but I'm going to go um, over, this is um, what we consider a map change. So that means changing a parcel from one zoning district to another. And I don't know if Laura, you can put that map up on the screen, which is the page two of the ordinance. Yeah, perfect. Um, so these parcels are down towards the um, East Hampton line. Um, the bottom parcel, is um, um, so I'll start with the general industrial to office industrial and the low the most southerly parcel is actually the Sunnyside um, building now that's been um, now the Sunnyside daycare for a couple years and then the parcel right behind it is also owned by Sunnyside um, it's currently zoned general industrial the um, uh, and then the parcel immediate abutting that is business park so um, the the reason to change all, this whole section of, to office industrial is to allow greater flexibility in the use and development of these parcels um, Sunnyside obviously is not going to build out to anything else um, it, and schools are allowed that kind of school is allowed no matter what the zoning district so whether it's a general an industrial district or an office industrial district it doesn't really affect the use of Sunnyside there um, the um, change from this whole area up till up to the Sunnyside parcel was once in the business in a zone that we had um, zoned business park and this was the only section in the city it was zoned business park it was multiple eight over 100 acres were zoned um, for business park the idea though was that you would have to assemble land um, uh, to create a, a literally a business park in order to get your permit so there were multiple I think five property owners at one point of all the parcels and the acreage along the west side of East Hampton Road um, and the idea was that eventually we get sewer on East Hampton Road and that you would develop a portion of that there. But as time has um, gone on, we know that we're not going to get sewer, um, at least Northampton sewer, developed there for any kind of uh, business park. We also have the state hospital that's built out since then. Um, and there are significant wetlands on um, the rear portion with vernal pools. and. Over time, actually, the parcel, which is um, um, just to the north and west of this, has since been transferred to the city of Northampton as um, permanently protected conservation area because of the um, ecological habitat that's there. So the, these are sort of the remaining parcels in that um, area that are developable. And so in order to um, sort of free them up for development, the idea is to rezone it to um, an industrial type use that individual property owners could um, build upon as opposed to trying to work with um, um, abutting property owners to assemble pieces. And they do relate to two others in the package, one with, uh, which is the elimination of the business park category overall throughout the zoning because it's no longer it's not going to be a viable option for the city anyone have any comments or suggestions out question question carolyn the, the parcel to the north of sunnyside bp to oi that that or that is sunnyside or it's not no the very the smallest square on the very south that's the sunnyside parcel they also own the little hook-shaped piece behind it. Uh, I'm sorry, west of it that sort of curves up. 
Um, there's no building on that parcel, but Sunnyside owns both those two parcels. But the one that is now BP and the one that is now GI. No, just thanks, Laura. Is this the yeah, that's yeah. Sunnyside, and the one immediately what abutting is it is Sunnyside. What? Say that again, please. See the arrow on the screen? Yeah. That's Sunnyside building. Which, there are two arrows. What? Oh no, she's uh, the cursor. The cursor. <coughs> the cursor. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, the moving arrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the one immediately sort of northwest is also Sunnyside. Thanks, Laura. Uh, the one that's labeled directly G. I mean, all of those three are currently GI to Office Industrial. But the one where the label is actually and where the current cursor is now has nothing on it. And um, oh. so will be um, more easily developed. And we do have our requirement as part of rezoning previously to general industrial, there's a development agreement that there has to be a shared access for the um, two northerly parcels, the ones with those labels on them, GI to OI and EP to OI, sharing a single driveway access. That's a planning board review process. But at any rate, they're two separately owned um, parcels and to be, you know, up for any other questions and comments from the public? Okay. Or on to the next item. Um, this is item 18.064. This is an ordinance to eliminate business park zoning in its entirety from the code referred by the city council. Carol. So because with this map change, now we'll eliminate any parcel in the city that's zoned that has the map categorization of business park. So the idea is to make sure we get rid of all the text references to business park and take it off the books. Any questions about that? I guess I would just ask is there no, um, in the foreseeable future, is there no reason why we would ever want to consider an area to be a business park again? Um, probably not. I mean, this was sort of a unique portion of the city that was, a, it, there was an attempt to address circumstances in an area where we wanted industrial development, but um, the underlying zone was residential, so there's all this language in there about converting. If you don't build residential, then you can only build in this way, and you have to work with your neighbors. We have now, we have Planned Village as a district, which um, allows multiple uses and, and also could in, um, be used in other places other than the State Hospital to sort of think about assemblages of land. We also have, um, you know, other, the industrial and general industrial, office industrial and general industrial zones that allow very similar type of uses. So it um, really is sort of an extraneous um, district at this point, and we sort of changed the way we think about development and trying to focus it on existing infrastructure. And I will say that um, there was, um, for this one, um, there was a slight amendment um, to the um, ordinance since it was originally submitted to council that just has um, more specificity about the references in the code that need to be addressed. And that was a comment from um, Councilor Alan Seawald about, um, about the fact that we should tell general code exactly which sections need to be addressed to eliminate that. So that, if you, when you vote like on it, yeah. yeah, when you vote on that, just, um, I guess, acknowledge that that's a Welcome change that since the, yeah. yeah. And that, that amendment that she's referring to is eliminate all references to business park, including subsection 3.1, subsection 3.4, and zoning map, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, all right. So, um, yeah, so no questions on that. Well, let's go up to 18.064. This is an ordinance to eliminate business park zoning in its entirety. Oh, yeah. Did that already. Sorry. Your ordinance to rezone conservation areas to farms, forests, rivers. And this was referred by the council on March 15th. Uh, Carol? Okay. 
So this is another map change, and if you could um, more scroll the map. Um, uh, this one also had a minor amendment um, where the red hand is. <laughs> um, there's a parcel that was not originally shown on the map submitted to council. It's not that entire piece that the red arrow is pointing to. I'll get into that in a second. But we've gone, um, the, per the idea behind all of these map changes is um, sort of a bulk transfer of conservation owned land out of its um, previous zoning district to farms, forests, and rivers, which is more consistent with um, the reality on the ground. These parcels won't be developed. So they're only city owned properties that have come into the conservation holdings. And um, the idea is that uh, as the city buys or accepts land as in gift from um, conservation or as a result of development that, are, that is being gifted to the city that will you know, permanently protect those parcels from development. Um, we set them, uh, you know, we create a list and then after a year or two years go by, we take that whole list of parcels and then rezone them to farms, forests, and rivers just so it matches the, so it's not still having a developable zone associated with those parcels. So some of these, even though the map is showing um, large swaths of open space that the city already owns and some of which are already farms, forests, and rivers, um, there may there are really just bits of pieces along the edges of those big blocks and that is because every time we own a parcel that abuts an existing piece that the city already owns the that new piece gets merged and becomes a bigger blob so there are no longer individual parcels that we've purchased but they become one giant parcel so um, uh, as an example um, so on the, actually, if, Laura, if you could scroll down to the lower, uh, where we just were on East Hampton Road, there's a big block there that would become Farms, Forests, and Rivers. That's the open space holding that the city purchased as part of removing the business park and, and um, from the zone there, and that's the piece that came into the conservation holding. So um, that's... It, it's a combination of a couple of parcels, but it will all be merged into one larger parcel. Um, the, I will also say, now that we're on the, looking at that parcel, there are two tiny squares in the middle of that um, blob in the south uh, to the no, inside, yeah, right there. Those are, I'm not going to get the technical term correct, but that's where the um, um, Tennessee gas pipeline box, you know, big, big um, transmission. Station, no, I, I'm not sure what they, oh, you <laughs> see them when you're, if you're driving down 66 and you look over, it's just these, um, an area where, I don't even know what it's for, but there's a, tra there's a, um, there's a connector station there. So there are two pads that are separately owned, one's by, um, one's owned by Berkshire, wait, um, and the other one's Tennessee Gas. Um, those are the only two parcels that will come into Farms, Forests, and Rivers that are not city-owned. But the reason we're doing that is because it's surrounded by city-owned property, and in fact, you can have transmission lines in Farms, Forests, and Rivers because it's an essential facility, so it's not really changing what's allowed. And it won't be ever anything else but the gas pipeline Any questions? <laughs> Council plan. Oh. Go ahead. Is that the ghost copper? Um, yes. Okay. So um, uh, uh, John was asking on um, Route 9 to the east side. The very, yeah. yeah. The long, narrow pieces, the right. former Girl Scout. So, in fact, the city has owned that for a couple right. of years, but we haven't moved it into the zoning class. This year? No, uh, uh, to the west. It's like right there, where the arrow is. Right where, oh, yeah. this thing? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of is a little bit of a segue into what I want to ask. I have a two-part question. I apologize for my ignorance of these matters. Um, 
so being zoned is form, farm, forest, whatever it's called, yeah. as opposed to conservation area. How does that affect the ability, part one of my question, how does that affect the ability of um, conservation groups to kind of steward the area? And how might it possibly affect um, the city's proposals to have hunting on these areas? as opposed to conservation land. And the reason it's a segue is because the Girl Scouts parcel is now under consideration for hunting. Uh -huh. So I'm curious. Sure. So um, <coughs> conserva So these, uh, I use the term conservation area just meaning that the city owns it for conservation purposes. It's not a zone classification. So for instance, the Girl Scouts, I think, is currently in a rural residential zone which um, implies that you can build housing at the rural residential density. Some of these other parcels are zoned suburban residential or URA or whatever other um, zoning classification they had been in. And so it's, um, even though they're owned by the city, they still have that um, original zoning designation until we take them out and put or transfer it to a different zone so farms, forests, and rivers is really just a zoning classification. It doesn't so it doesn't speak to management. With conservation is what you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. It's okay. owned and it's been permanently protected in the deeds and w depending on whatever mechanism it came into the city, it's permanently protected as open space. But this is just changing the zoning classification so people aren't looking at the map saying, oh, that looks like a residential zone. Maybe I'll look around there to see if I can build. It's going to be, it's going to have farms, forests, and rivers classification. So be like, oh, that's really restrictive. And the only thing you can really, so, and that's different from how you manage conservation. So management of conservation would speak to what activities are allowed on those conservation um, lands, whether it's you know, canoeing or hiking or hunting or whatever it is. So just to clarify, so the farms, forest, rivers, there is no list of uses by right because it's all There are uses allowed by right, like open space, conservation type uses, and then there's a li limited development of um, available, um, but you have to do it in a way that permanently protects a portion of the property. So it's, and it was an originally created as a zoning classification when we um, were developing the plans for the state hospital. We wanted sort of a, tr a transfer of development rights. Um, so it was packaged with transfer of development rights way in the, I guess, late 1990s when the zoning was first envisioned. So, but now, um, we're sort of using it as, as um, a classification that really is more, speaks more to um, sort of the reality on the ground. It's, um, it's either farms, forests, or rivers, conservation area. Any other questions? Any other comments? Yeah, no. the, the single largest portion in the middle, where is that? Just um, figure out where that huge conservation area is. It might be Sawmill <coughs> Hills. Yeah. I'm that's sorry, what? Sawmill Hills conservation area. So what that, and that's an example of another holding where there's just a small portion. I think the finger coming down is maybe um, a portion of the piece that's not already Farms, Forest, and River. But some of that Sawmill Hills is already in that classification. It's just that they're we've added land to that conservation area and that land that has been added since we last went through this process um, uh, we're just trying to match the zoning of the rest of the conservation area anyone else okay let's uh, move on to the next item before i let get it right let's see or we're at B. 18.066 is an ordinance to rezone a portion of property from URB to Office Industrial. Um, okay. So this property is another map change um, on Federal Street, and it currently, um, it's on the, uh, I guess that would be the west side of uh, Federal Street. 
Um, backs right up to the river. It's currently known to have the building that's referred to as the Wireworks. Um, and the idea is that, um, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, it's in the urban residential B district. And so um, in order to help facilitate reuse and regeneration of that building, um, um, rezoning it to office industrial will sort of remove the um, permitting um, impediments that might be viewed as in, in terms of um, being able to reuse that building. So you can't really put residential there um, uh, because it would take an enormous amount of reinvestment and change. And also I think there's some work that's been done, um, cleanup work that um, might stipulate um, through DEP's eyes that residential can't be located in certain, you know, I think there's gonna be an activities and use limitation that restricts residential there. It's also partially in the floodplain, so we don't want to introduce residential uses necessarily in the floodplain. Um, but this part, this portion of the parcel is really the developed portion only. It has the building and then an abutting parking lot. And um, it doesn't, in the zoning proposed in front of you does not include the parking lot across the street that's on the high school side of Federal Street. And it doesn't include all the land that's also owned by the same property owner that goes across the river and up sort of behind the Riverside Drive homes. It's really just for this, a carve out for this building so that um, it will hopefully facilitate the reinvestment and reuse and, and provide a, a sort of a wider range of opportunities um, for the reuse of the building. Uh, what I was starting to say was about, I don't know, 12 or more years ago, um, when their ownership changed hands, there was a, a zoning board of appeals review process to allow certain uses there, but it's still restricted now because of its residential classification. Um, this is not project specific, though. This is not what would, what would run the risk of being spot zoned to accommodate one particular buyer. No, we have no, we have no idea what the uh, property owner wants to do. We know, and I think everybody knows, the property is not fully utilized now. And I think, um, you know, I had a meeting with Bay State Neighborhood Association about, I don't know, six months ago about the concept of potentially rezoning just this. And, you know, there's concern in the neighborhood about the fact that the building is falling apart and derelict and they're concerned about what happens then, you know, as it continues to deteriorate without sort of reuse of the building. So I think from the neighborhood perspective, they were they would like to see it, um, you know, as a viable reused building. And I'm sorry, sir, to speak to that, the idea is, you know, we have industrial buildings along the Mill River that, um, you know, are zoned industrial, and it sort of is a legacy of our um, history in terms of where industry was located. And so the idea in our plan is that we encourage the reuse of those old mill buildings and industrial buildings. So it's consistent with the plan, and as long as you have zoning that's consistent with the plan, then um, you are not creating a spot zone just for a particular you know, user. Anyone have any questions about this? Okay. Can I ask one more quick question? Sure, yeah. Sorry, Carolyn, just confirm um, there is no residential use in office industrial? There is residential use allowed um, above the second floor. Okay. And so you all, as uh, city council, just recently made that tweak to allow it not to necessarily have to be related to the use in the building, but it could be completely separate. Okay. So that's another potential. Yeah. So, so you can like, still have residential there. So yes. potentially live or Or even just live, but uh, below yeah. first floor, okay. uh, separate commercial. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Uh, okay, we're up to item E. This is 18.067, an ordinance to rezone four residential properties on Riverside Drive from General Industrial to URB. Um, so the change here is on the other side of um, Bay State, um, and it's really sort of 
evaluating the neighborhood and maybe cleaning up and making it easier for residential users to expand or can um, continue to use their properties as they've been used for you know since the structures were built these are homes these are all existing residences but they've been in a general industrial zone because of their proximity to the end there um, where first arc is and some of those other industrial buildings so the idea really here is to um, so zoning when you have a zoning district it's really supposed to reflect the policy and sentiments of the city so with a general industrial zone essentially the city saying we hope that in the future this will transition out of residential and be industrial and so what we're saying now is that's probably um, not such a good policy sentiment to make to hold on to because they're viable residential uses we don't see that there'll be demand for industrial uses it's a butts of residential neighborhood so let's turn that around and, and really bring it into the residential district and that also makes it easier for homeowners to make expansions within the residential district instead of having to go to the zoning board for expansions when your your zone doesn't match what your use is the this um, other piece of it is because the back portion of the properties are in the floodplain will we'll rezone the flood the hundred year flood FEMA map floodplain areas to special conservancy consistent with the way we've treated all other residentially um, used properties questions about this yeah um, sure. we have some questions um, we live on Riverside Drive and our plot is the one that says to special conservancy up there and so that is pretty much our entire backyard um, and Good so question. yeah so and here I'm sorry, can, can I ask you to identify yourself for the sure, public yes, record? Sure, yes, my name is Kristen Shaw, and this is my husband, Justin Wentworth, and we live at 638. Kristen Shaw and Justin Wentworth. Yeah, and we live at 638 Riverside Drive. Six. Thanks. So, and, and I'm sorry, and you're in, did you hear the question, Carol? Yeah, so, the, so where the label is pointing to Special Conservancy, again, it's at a it's very consistent with the floodplains throughout the city that yards are um, often in the FEMA map floodplain um, and that's fine it shouldn't it, um, there's nothing wrong with having I mean in fact that's a sort of an absorption area for flooding um, what we don't want to see and even as an in industrial with an over floodplain overlay building structures in that area is um, uh, needs to meet special standards in the building code and also uh, permits from the conservation require, uh, commission are required so that piece won't change with the with the zoning classification of special conservancy the thing that will change is that um, well um, in one way it can change in special conservancy there is a restriction on building new residential units but um, I think it, it as an industrial zone area you wouldn't be able to necessarily build residential anyway because you would need to go to the zoning board to expand your residential use so there's probably not really much change at all um, for that portion that's in the floodplain because it's so restricted anyway with the um, requirements of building code and conservation commission so essentially very little has changed other than the terms of the names of the of the designated area the same restrictions that you already have will not be expanded nor will they be reduced it sounds like so as far as the the resale value of our property and the saleability if someone was well actually council murphy it. might be able to <laughs> well, i'm just going to ask a question about that so <coughs> so all the structures including your home are in the area that's going to be changed to urb because the slope there is pretty it goes down to the river right. so the structures that are there now are in the area to be changed to URB which is helpful to homeowners because they can go get permits and they're in a residential zone the back of it is already general industrial floodplain so it's in the it's in the hundred year floodplain so you couldn't do anything with it now really anyway right. so to change it from general industrial floodplain to special con conservancy really doesn't make any much of a difference either because you can still have your yard there right. you just couldn't put structures there before and you can't put structures there now right. so it, in that sense it really doesn't change much right. 
uh, still your yard, but you can't put any buildings down there because, in fact, it, as we know from Maine's field, it does flood every now and then for real. So, okay. right. does that help at all? That uh, <coughs> really isn't going to change the floodplain part because it's already floodplain. And in terms of the residential, you know, I mean, I think um, Council Murphy, you can probably speak to this, but. Um, uh, if you go to sell your home and you're in a, you're a non-conforming use in a zone, it may have some effect on. Um, yeah, you, you, you know. it's it's legal non-conforming because you're not in a conforming zone. So it's actually better for the houses to be URB because that's a zone for residential. So if you want building permits, you don't have any issues. You can just go get them, and you're a conforming use in a conforming zone. Yeah. So it's actually that's actually better. I don't see where the back changes that much because it's it's floodplain now. If we call it a special conservancy floodplain or GI floodplain, it's still floodplain. You still can't put anything down there. And if you did now, you don't need flood insurance because your dwelling isn't in a flood zone. But if you put right. buildings down there, then you know flood zone. So that would really not the purpose. And so my takeaway from that is, in fact, actually this will not deleteriously affect your resale value any further than it is would be challenged now. It may even enhance it by by actually making it taking it out of non-conforming status and putting it into conformance status. So so but I, I don't think that means you'll suddenly realize I'm told millions, but <laughs> at the same time I don't think you can take a big hit. So are there, are there any other questions? Or follow ups on that? No? Okay. All right. So um, this comes to uh, I, this is item F or item 18.068. This is an ordinance to eliminate newspaper legal notice requirement for site review projects. Hmm. Um, so site plan review is a planning board review of permits that's um, not doesn't have its um, um, the regulations are not spelled out specifically in state statute as our special permits which are other permits that planning board can um, issue and in Northampton um, when site plan review was initially adopted as a tool for the planning board to use to review projects these are by right uses but need additional technical review um, the city council adopted rules that said just match what you have to do under state statute for special permits and we'll call it a day it was the simplest thing to do um, so fast forward I don't know 20 years and um, not too many people read legal notices but the cost of putting legal ads in the newspaper <laughs> there's one person that reads legal notices but the cost of, to the city continues to rise for putting those legal notices in the paper. So we're not required by state statute to put a legal notice in the paper for site plan. So the idea is for this one and the subsequent one that we will go over is to just remove that out of the code um, knowing that we still do all the other requirements. We still mail notice to the abutters. We still um, require that yellow signs be posted, which is also not a statutory requirement but that yellow public notice signs be put in people's yards, notifying um, you know, anybody who goes by that there's something of special note to um, look at. So it's really just um, taking that newspaper posting um, out of the mix to help save the city a little bit of money. So council member. Well, it also would save you a little time potentially too, right, because the notice is a there's a timing sequence for the notices yeah. have to go out, and you might actually be able to include it in a meeting agenda quicker if you don't have to comply with that. Right. I mean, we still need to notify a butter, so there's still that timing, which is pretty close to the tracks mm -hmm. closely with the newspaper, but you're right. Yeah. And the site, and, and I, I, since I'm not a planning board, the site plans are basically, um, to, your site plan reviews are basically to deal with the layout of whatever is going on the site, but it's permitted use for that location. So the fence goes here, the shrubs go here, the that kind of thing. Yeah. So it's not a, a dramatic thing like a change in use or or uh, something of that nature. It could be dramatic, but it's not a typically change a change of use. <laughs> Depending on your definition of dramatic. Yeah. 
Um, is, is there, and forgive my ignorance on this, but do we also make this information available on the website? <coughs> Our public For public notice, notifications of? We don't do public notifications on the website except that other than the agendas yes. that are posted with all the information about each hearing. And then we mail, um, there's a 300 foot of utter notice requirement for every single prop, uh, uh, project that triggers planning board review. Um, so um, that gets mailed specifically to property owners. Because there is also, I mean, I think in Civic Plus, there's an opportunity to actually, if it's come to, it would be relatively simple, anything that, for instance, any notification that you would send out could also be replicated on the website if somebody wanted to look. If somebody actually, if someone actually went and sat in and checked out all the various permit, uh, the permitting issues, that they'd have an opportunity to see it there. Yeah. But that's a recommendation. I'm not making that amendment. Be something I mean, because if the, the website does allow for that, at least, at least that's my understanding. Um, any other questions or discussion on this point about the newspaper ads? Okay. Um, the last item is item 18069. This is an ordinance to what? Yeah, so the other, other newspaper elimination this is to eliminate the newspaper legal notice requirements for projects that need central business architecture review? So um, central business architecture uh, review process is not in zoning. It's a separate code um, section. And again, um, when it was initially adopted 20 years ago or more, um, the idea was to um, mirror what um, legal requirements were um, um, uh, for the planning board special permit process. So same thing, we're not required to notify um, um, people in the newspaper through legal notice. So the idea is to save that money um, still notifying people of utters um, within 300 feet of the public hearings. Um, and also we also require the yellow signs to be posted at the property, so anybody who's not in a butter or anybody in the city can see those signs. Do you, do you have a ballpark estimate on both of these? How much they, how much money is invested in the, in the ads? Um, I so every couple of weeks, ballpark, every um, public hearing, um, which is you know twice a month, we can run anywhere between um, two hundred and um, well, let's say. Uh, 150 and 350 dollars a month uh, per um, posting. So if we have hearings twice a month, you know that could be 500 dollars a month, and that's just planning board side. Central business doesn't see as many permits, but the legal notice and the legal notice would be a little bit less, maybe a little bit less than 100 dollars. But it's it's gone up precipitously. The other piece I would say is we've moved a lot of things from special permit to site plan over the years. Um, so actually, the site, the number of items triggering this newspaper requirement has has gone up. So, okay, well, a significant amount of money yeah. ultimately over the year. Yeah. Of course, of course, we may lose the different. paper record as a result, but that's not our job. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, <laughs> well, that would be trouble if we're the ones that bring <laughs> the planning yeah, board. I should say it's the planning board's fault. That's right. <laughs> You're the major source of income. Right. <laughs> they probably have bigger problems. Uh, yeah. Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay. That's actually all the items before us today in this hearing. Um, anyone have any comments on them holistically or in general? Any thoughts? No? Close the public hearing. There's a motion to close the public hearing. Is there a second? And a second. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, please say aye. 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 On all of them, or can we just, I mean, can we just vote on all of them together? Well, there's, there's a couple. 
There's a couple of processes you're saying that we've got to figure out, and actually, well, I've got to figure out because it's my first rodeo and there's joint hearings with you guys. So, um, uh, insofar as that this is actually not your meeting, you got lucky and got to attend to our meeting, and we're trying to figure out, and then we also have items after this. Now, I'm not sure, I think it's appropriate, possibly, and we're all free to kibitz about this, that you guys can actually, while we're still in session, if you want to um, vote on, on them, unless you anticipated an enormous debate and discussion that could take us into late in the night, in which case I'd, I'd get down on my knees and beg no. <laughs> say, do, the, do we have to vote separately? I mean, are we, are we you, two bodies kind of operating? Yes, yeah. so you would vote separately because you're making a recommendation to city council, full city council. Um, Legislative Matters is also making a separate recommendation to full city council. Right. And they um, typically, you know, one of the um, pieces about having a joint hearing is they get to hear you right. deliberate and decide what you you know, hear what your comments might be. So back to Sam's question, though, could we say, if assuming there's not a lot of discussion <coughs> or concern, could we say we have a, you know, we vote in favor of this slate of changes? Sure, you might want to take, yeah, yeah, someone could make that motion to um, recommend all the various ordinances and if there was a board member that wanted to take one out and have a discussion about it and put it separately, you know, you could find that out through that process. Um, but I don't, there's nothing preventing you from taking it as a package. I feel comfortable with what we already discussed and I have a specific, you know, I had came into it with a couple of questions that have all been answered and so I don't have issues with any individual recommendations. Yeah, I feel comfortable voting out on a yeah. on motion. So Tess, would you like to make a motion? Oh, yes, I'd like to make a motion that we recommend the city, city council legislative affairs committee um, to adopt and accept all the recommended changes to both the zoning map and the zoning code um, as outlined in Second by Dan. All in favor? Yep. Bang. Okay. Well, that was painless. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> um, we seen the begging would have been. Yeah, well, it would have been. It was tempting. It was tempting. <laughs> I'm disappointed. <laughs> Listen, I'll make an appointment to beg anybody. <laughs> so. All right, now we come to the um, our deliberate point. So. We're done. So I, I, I'm. What I'll do is, I think I'm going to move them like in groups that are related. Okay. So I would move um, 18063 to rezone parcels uh, on East Hampton Road and the 18064 eliminate business park okay. together because they're related. They're in the same place. Okay, so that's a motion to move those two, but that's a second. This, <coughs> yes, I have a positive right now. Uh, discussion. Question. All those in favor of forwarding uh, those two items uh, with a favorable recommendation of the council, please say aye. And then I would move the conservation parks for the river is 18 for a positive recommendation. Okay. Uh, discussion on those? <coughs> okay. All those in favor of uh, a favorable uh, recommendation of the city council. Uh, please say aye. Aye. Then I would move the two base state zonings, 18066 and 18067, together. Discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <coughs> and I'd move the two legal notice ones, 18068 and 18069. Okay. Discussion on those. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Um, before you do that, I just want to let you know that neither I nor Wayne will be available for your um, next council meeting, which I assume these will be coming on the agenda. So if you um, would, are okay with flying. We could run them up. I am, I feel 100% assured that you have no problem with that. I just wanted to let you know, we, I would be available for the subsequent, like your second reading okay, if good. you needed. Yeah. But I just wanted to put that out there that um, 
neither of us would be available. And any questions that should come up in this first reading, should it survive the first reading, I'm confident it will, but um, we'll forward to you so you'd be okay. prepared for the second reading. Okay. Okay. Sounds like a party. All right. Thanks. You're welcome to stay. We're going to be discussing taxis. We're going to our own meeting across the parking lot. So don't be jealous. Will you be okay? Taxis, yes. Probably not. Stay around for that fucking thing. We can always pay very easily here. Make it easier. We'll send Bill up to the bank for some reason. Yeah. You guys do. We're the parking lot. We're the parking lot. Okay. Got that. So where are we on our timeline now? So we that they did yeah, yeah. They move to close the public hearing. Well, Carolyn will fix that. Just a, yeah. just a safety. Okay. Well, feel free to let us, I mean, so let us know if we can. Okay, okay. Okay. So now we're up to item 17.265, and that's an ordinance relative to taxes and vehicles for hire. This is referred back to us on March. I think we're on year two on this. At least. Um, okay, give me a sec. And currently, actually, the issue that, that was referred back to us was specific to the insurance. And the question about the insurance requirements in Northampton, which turned out, uh, Mr. Miller, who was, let the record show that Jeffrey Miller is here, uh, had pointed out that would be virtually unique. Um, and uh, the council, uh, originally there was a conversation, the recommendation was from the city solicitor um, to raise the uh, liabilities to reflect more closely his understanding of what, what um, potential risks were and how much cost would be. Um, but in, in the interim, it's been revealed that one, uh, Mr. Miller has testified, and since he's the only person who's actually pursued this, Testify that it's virtually impossible to try to find an insurance company that would actually subsidize or would underwrite this. Um, because even Boston at this point doesn't have anything similar to this, uh, to the rate requirements that were we specified in, in, the, um, in these amended ordinance, in this amended ordinance. So specifically, we're talking about. Um, uh, the current, and it is the current rate, which is the 100,000, uh, 300,000 liability package, which I um, understand all surrounding communities have, or they have language stipulating that it uh, would conform with the state requirements, which actually I don't know what the state requirements are for insurance. Uh, that's what Amherst has, but um, and the solicitor unfortunately is not able to join us today, so and he probably would know. Jeffrey, do you have an idea? I believe it's 2040. Oh, it's 2040? the same as, yeah, yeah, basically. I mean, the cabs in Boston, that's what they carry. You 2040? Know, that's really? what they're required to carry. Wow. Okay. City. And I think that's on a very low, low end, but that's what the state requires. Okay. So, so that's the state minimum is, is a 2040 split. 20,000, 40,000 split. Yes. Or 100,000, 300,000, which works as you would testify. Would be like personal, it would be the same as your personal auto insurance. Right. I mean, and, and you have, uh, we have in the record that you have submitted that it, it comes up to about $6,000 per vehicle at the current rate, right? Where I'm at now. Yeah. yeah. And the proposed one will be closer to 10,000 per vehicle. Nine is what I was rate. told by, by my insurance. Uh, provider and he, you know, he, he kind of just laughed and said, good luck, <laughs> you know, and he, he, of course, he said he would try to find something, but it would be in that ballpark. Okay. So. Um, any questions about this? Any discussion points on this? I guess I would just say that <clears throat> I think it um, behooves us to do our own research. I mean, we have the testimony of Mr. Miller, which I think is you know, extremely helpful, but I think that we have to 
um, either ask the city solicitor to, to, to do this level of research or we on the committee need to do it or perhaps our administrative assistant can do some but we have to look into this a little bit more deeply before we can make our final recommendation well I have done some you know I went online to check point back actually because these are all public records and the ones I mean what Mil Mr. Miller has reflected is that at least it corresponds with exactly what Mr. Miller has reflected in terms right. of accessing new policies too though yeah that I'm yeah not to, I don't know Just the cost of the policy I did I also guess. include um, some information from the uh, Amherst bylaw Greenfield I believe yeah you did, uh, you did Holy you, Oak and those are attached in your left field yeah. and I did some follow-up on those Which yeah, we don't have I don't yeah. have um, the rate numbers as you say um, we, we basically we have all we know about how much competing insurance companies would offer they'd be similar in price um, well what's your suggestion to you well what I would do is make a motion that we maintain the 100 300 and send it back to council and then if you feel strongly that we shouldn't do that don't second it and we'll do more research but oh, and we one. also we would have first and second reading as, as well we're to, to find out but yeah, yeah. yeah so anyways I move the that we keep the 100 300 level we have now and not push it any higher I'll second that for Sorry. the purposes of the discussion. I have okay, so that. discussion. I, I guess I, I would want to revisit, maybe one of you remember what um, Solicitor Seawald's just uh, rationale was for actually raising these rates. Do we know well, that? I, I talked to him when, and Councilor Murphy was there when it actually happened. I asked him to follow it up, and I think I, I said in the course of the meeting, he told me on the phone. He was fine if we changed it, but he was he was more adamant when I guess at when he at the meeting about mm -hmm. um, I, I think he was fine with it because it, it was going to require him to come into the meeting to participate in the conversation. <laughs> but um, um, but mm -hmm. but uh, Councilman Murphy, I would defer to you on that. Oh no, I think I think he it it was like he hadn't seen what it was before. And said, "Oh my goodness, the potential liability is higher. It should be higher than this." But I don't. I think it was sort of a sort of a knee-jerk thing. Like this seemed really low to him, because I know in, in in some cases, even you know professional people that occasionally take clients around go for the two the two fifty five hundred. But for them, the risk pool is totally different, so the cost is more reasonable. Um, in this case, clearly the insurance. The underwriting industry says for doing this for a cap, it's ten thousand a car a year. I know a lot of people in my business that drive clients around have two fifty five hundred, but their rates are nowhere near ten thousand dollars a year. You know, maybe they they'll pay a couple hundred dollars more for it, even though in your own insurance. Sometimes you can raise it a lot and the cost is minimal. Not the case with the caps, you know. And I'm, my my concern is that uh, given the way. They underwrite them and the rates for them. It's a little, it's a little much to ask somebody to pay ten grand a year for, you know. If it was, if we we're talking about a, a two hundred dollar bump or cab or something, I'd say yeah, push it to two fifty five hundred. But if it's you know four thousand dollars, when it's already six, that seems a little much to me, given the, the way the insurance I industry. I completely handled. agree with you, and I, I guess my only hesitation was, you know, was there some rationale? that really um, the, something that the solicitor know the city solicitor knows that that we don't have access to here and now um, but I think it would be really useful if we could get him to come to the city sure. and the city council. Well what he, it, what he said to me was that it was his experience with personal injury law that the the amount of coverage he thinks is inadequate but then he acknowledged that if that if that's the standard under undervaluing the coverage. And if it means shutting down cab companies in our city, that's not useful. Either. Exactly, and that was his point. He, he said that his concern was that he understood the concern about the fact that it would make it, we would be depriving people who actually need the service, particularly people who are underserved, um, 
by making this choice. Now, ultimately, obviously, an accident would, uh, a, a rather large accident with considerable liability attached to it would essentially wipe out a cap company as well based on the coverage is essentially what it's saying. But in this case, rather than actually put an onerous impact on, he was willing to accept us maintaining the current rate. The, the other place where I've seen individuals do it, in most cases, if you want a million dollar blanket liability policy for personal, for yourself, they'll make you do the 25500 on the vehicles and then they'll write the million dollars oh. on top of it. But that's probably not the case for cab companies. I don't know if you... I just think that the... the the cabs are more susceptible or they're seen more susceptible because they're out supposedly rolling around. We for one here are 90 to 95 percent phone in calls so we're not really you're not taxi fares so not, yeah. much but we're you know we're covered in that case to, for people you know trans being transported from their homes and airports and you know um, it's not like the city but everything that's is based on how it's done in the city so it's kind of that's how it's seen and even in new york it's 100 300 and and uh, along those lines if you're paying that much for insurance then the vehicles you have are, are going to be unsafe because you're not going to have money to put into your vehicles <laughs> i mean so it's yeah. i was to say robbing Peter to pay, <laughs> you know yeah. it's right Okay, so the recommendation, um, any other discussion on the recommendation? All those in favor of sending um, to the council a recommendation to maintain the current insurance rate of 100, 300 split, please say aye. 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 That's you the recommendation of legislative matters. Question I have, um, logistically, is, is this not an amendment to the Oh, well, that's yeah. a good question. <laughs> oh, that's an excellent question. Um, Thank you for following through with this. Oh, yeah. Well, it's pretty important to me. I he was know. a young lad when you started this process. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I, I would accept that if you want to make that as an amendment to this, I think that's oh, probably that the better way to proceed. Yeah, that we amend. So we send it forward with a positive recommendation with the amendment that you keep the rate, the insurance yeah. rate, as uh, status quo as right. it is. I'll All second that. that. Okay, that's a real okay. <laughs> we'll do it one way, we'll do it the other way, and then it'll be right. We'll <laughs> double down, <laughs> belt and suspenders. We'll let Laura catch up here for a second. And the positive recommendation with the amendment that right. you yeah. the current rate. Because everything else is okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so it looks like it's in this section. To vehicle registration requirements, <coughs> paragraph two. So, when I send it back, would it say it's at, at least two hundred fifty thousand? Exactly. The amended. hundred thousand. Yeah. At least three hundred thousand. Right. Exactly. That would, okay. Yeah. So that would be. That'd be the strike. Key. Yep. So we're lining an amended ordinance. <laughs> Essentially. This has been tortured for two years. This ordinance. Well, actually, let's vote on this. All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please say aye. aye. And, and, and we'll include that with the rec that is the recommendation as well. Okay. All right. Feel a little better? Yeah, yeah a little bit. Yeah. All down the way. Wait till the next out. council meeting. You never know. You'll have to vote. <laughs> One door closes. And yes, that's right. Who knows what's next? So. So. Okay. See, at least I'm here to see it happen. And I'm I'm with Elisa here on this. Uh, thank you for uh, catching us up. Yeah. As you notice, it's a whole new legislative matters group. In fact, we're missing one. But. But so, Council Murphy who's endured this from from the beginning. And it was yeah, in was city, in. wasn't it in city services before that? It was in resources. Oh, resources. Yeah. oh yeah. So, so it you came. Did, you did too. It came to us from there. Well, and well then, refined then. Right? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, there's no new business. I'm um, we'll move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. Aye. Thank you all very much.